Hi, I'm Alex. I'm an author, I'm a journalist, but the truth of the matter is I think of myself as a storyteller. Uh, storytelling is my religion. It's I have this fierce, fundamental belief in the power of narrative. Um, you know, we craft stories to make sense of the world, to make sense of our own lives and uh, and those around us. And, and the very act of storytelling, um, I think, is an act of hope. Um, and look, people don't like to be pushed or pulled. They don't like to be yelled at or dismissed or pandered to. And that's the power of story, of narrative. It lets people find their own way, um, especially at this moment in time where there's far too much shouting going on, too much ranting, too much stay at home. Here's what I think. I know what is best diatribes from people who have little curiosity for the lives of those whose experiences are different from their own. Um, you know, think about it, stories do two things. Um, one, they bring us places we otherwise wouldn't venture and introduce us to people we otherwise wouldn't meet. It opens up our horizons. But the other thing that story does, it also affirms our experiences. It, it gives credence to our personal and collective histories. Stories, in the end, make us feel less alone. You know, think about it. Stories inform policy. They inform the way we allocate resources. They inform our laws. They inform the present, and they help shape the future. But it's really important when we think about story that we not craft a single narrative, that we not pigeonhole people, not think we already know when, in fact, we know very little. The other thing I should say about story, I mean, this is the centripetal force of, of storytelling is this notion of empathy, this capacity to put us in the shoes of others, um, to help us understand the world through the eyes of people whose experiences might be completely different from our own. And not only is empathy the centripetal force of storytelling, but it's also the central force of community. It's what holds us together. It's what binds us. And God knows we're at a moment where empathy is sorely missing. Um, it's become far too easy in these times to point fingers at those whose lives are unlike our own and where in the unfamiliar we see not ourselves, but rather a threatening force. And so we need to tell stories. I often think about Brian Stevenson, the great human rights lawyer who talks about the power of proximity. And that's what stories do. They bring us close to others. They let us see what they see and hear what they hear. And it's what I try to do is to create proximity through storytelling. As you probably know about my work, I'm drawn to stories of those pushed aside along the margins, those whose lives have been shaped by neglect or hate or greed, um, those who my dear friend and mentor Studs Terkel like to call the et ceteras of the world. And it's in their stories, I think, that we can best measure whether we're holding ourselves up to the ideals of this country, uh, to this foundational belief in equity and justice. Uh, I should also say that I am drawn to small stories. And by that, I mean really intimate stories. Uh, uh, and I believe in what I think of as the bigness of a small story. Um, I remember, you know, when I found my way to my first book, There Are No Children Here, I had uh, gone out to visit uh, a public housing project here in Chicago, where I had just landed. This is in the mid-1980s, and I was really knocked off balance. And in fact, I felt ashamed. Um, I thought to myself, how is it I could not know? I mean, these projects that I went to were only a mile from my office than downtown. And so I wanted to get people to sit up and listen and to take notice. And so my question is, how do you do that? And so for me, it was about finding story. And I chose to write about two boys, these brothers uh, who were living in this public housing project. And I was with these boys virtually every day for two years. I was talking with them, talking with their family and friends to gang members and to the police, to teachers and city officials. I wanted to walk in their shoes. And look, I know I'll never fully understand what it meant to grow up in a place like the Henry Horner homes, but I wanted to come as close as I could get. And in this reporting, it was also important to me that I understand how we got to this place, this moment in time. 
I think there was an assumption then uh, and still often that people uh, living in these neighborhood of such despair and disrepair was because of choices they had made. But that gets it wrong. It gets it so wrong. And you look just, for example, at the history of public housing. Uh, you know, white politicians in the 1950s didn't want them built in their neighborhoods. And so as a result, they built them at the edge of already existing Black ghettos, and they served as a kind of bulwark to segregation. What's more, the High-rises were all built on the cheap. They were built with naked cinder blockers, heating pipes snaking through the apartments. There were no lobbies to speak of. You just simply, uh, so that the buildings were completely exposed to Chicago's harsh weather. And what's more, they were run by a gentleman, Charlie Swibel, who didn't at all care about the people living there. He just cared about holding on to power, um, to having this position where he could hand out jobs to family and friends. And so it's really essential that if we're going to understand the present, we also have to go and make sense of the past. I've got to say, as I mentioned, I have this fierce belief in the power of narrative. But if I'm being honest, uh, that faith has been challenged in recent years. It's impossible, I think, to think about storytelling now without acknowledging that it's been weaponized by people in positions of great power who tell false stories. And they tell these false stories not out of necessity, but rather to affirm what they think they already know, and of course, to hold on to power. So, and this perhaps goes without saying, if we're going to tell stories, we need to do honestly and squarely to what we've seen and heard. They need to be true to what we've come to learn and to know. They need to knock us off balance and poke and prod what we thought we already knew. For stories, if not told honestly, they lead to a lazy, simplified view of the world and a lazy, simplified view of humanity. And stories, if not told honestly, will only push us further apart. They'll aid and abet injustices and cruelty. And we need to tell stories, but we also need to work hard at listening, at hearing the stories, the unpredictable stories of those whose voices get lost amidst the cacophonous noise of ideologues and rhetorical ruffians. And we need to listen with humility, with an open heart, and with a sense that we're all in this journey together.